Ah oui, est-ce que vous... Okay. Vous pouvez mettre le micro, ok. Merci. Excuse me, uh, all of you are um, uh, PASA presenters here, ok, PASA presenters, are, are you? So, ok, right, thank you. Pardon Non, c'est pas ça, c'est en fait, c'est les, les flashs pour PASA presenters. Dire. On, on démarre alors C'est l'heure à peu près, non Oui. C'est l'heure ou pas Donc, donc j'y vais Je te prends le micro un petit peu alors Hi. Hello. Right. Uh, this is an, an announcement for the uh, flash, flash poster presentation. So I invite all the people who will present their poster to come to the front rows. There will be a seat uh, with your name and your poster. They are numbered and your number is written on the back of your uh, name tag. Uh, all the presenters will be called by line, right? So when your line will be called, so there will be um, uh, slides calling your line. So please uh, proceed to this stairway. So you will have 30 seconds to present your uh, poster. And afterwards, please proceed to the other stairway to come back to your chair, right? So you will have one poster inviting the next line, and so on and so forth. We'll hope that it works. Thank you very much. So, hi, I'm Diane from Fincar. Um, I'm super glad to be here. Uh, a bit scared also. Um, since we're a, a proud sponsor of uh, the event, uh, we're supposed to spend the next 10 minutes uh, together. Um, me explaining you, uh, by the mean of a corporate PowerPoint, uh, what we do, and you potentially, like, patiently faking um, to listen to what I'm, what I'm saying. So um, unfortunately, or fortunately, you tell me, uh, that's not how we do things uh, I think are. Um, and because I thought that um, a formal presentation would be a bit boring, um, I have had this brilliant idea um, we could just turn the center of Congress into a, a dance floor for a couple of minutes um, while projecting some dancing gifts. But um, because I thought, um, um, on the first hand, I'm not a great dancer. And um, in another hand, uh, I'm not allowed to broadcast um, um, these uh, gifts without paying some copyrights. Um, so I'm sorry, but we have still eight minutes and 40 seconds uh, together. Uh, so I suppose I'll have to give you an overview of um, uh, Thinkar anyhow. And to be honest, we had some guidelines. So this is what we do for a living. 
Um, these are some products we offer. And this is our current work. Um, I could tell you a little bit about our contributions to uh, the R community, especially in France, um, and also promote some of uh, our open source products. Um, but the first truly important thing I had to say today is that there are still some Knights of the Pipes uh, playable to win. Um, following this URL, so there are a couple of questions, and um, if you score more than 60%, please claim your prize at our desk in the um, uh, foyer Concorde. Uh, the second important thing I had to say is that we are hiring. Um, so since you grabbed your smartphone to try to win the last play mobile we have, um, what I suggest instead is to use the Slido platform um, to run through a little quiz uh, about the team members of Thinkar. So there's nothing to win this time. Um, it's just a chance to know what's better. And um, I have the secret hope that someone will well, it could trigger the will to join us uh, in, in Paris. So the first question... is... Colin has an R-related tattoo, tattoo somewhere on his body. Oh! Unfortunately... So you can change your answers. Well, not yet. Not yet. So he has a Chrome Tyrex on his calf, right? You could check up there the, uh, the presentation. Um, he suggested to invite a tattoo artist on our booth, but uh, Sebastian had a, a better idea and suggested some Knight of the Play, play, play Mobile. So no, this is false, and this was the true answer. The next question is, who used to wear a tie in his previous job and now works remote watching cycling while coding? Oh, this is great. So obviously it's not me. I don't wear a tie and I'm not fond of cycling. Hmm. That's cool. This, this is Salvan. Um, working remote was something new for him. So I guess he's the one who had the, the great change before his previous job in the French uh, administration. So who said, I see, I see rasters everywhere, even in waffles? Oh. No, I, it's not me. Um, actually, he told me what raster was. So you can change your answer. No. The, the one who is uh, specialized in spatial data uh, at Thinkar is uh, Sebastian, who is also known as StatinMup on Twitter. Yeah, cool, thank you. Oh, this one, I love this one. What's Vincent's favorite place to code? So let me give you a clue. Um, it costs us one laptop a year. <laughs> yeah, this is a pretty expensive habit, but this is truly the place he, he loves to code in his bath. Okay, so next question. Oh no, not this one. <laughs> you cannot even try to vote, the question is locked. Um, and I, <laughs> I don't want to burn into ashes the center of Congress. So a better question to close my uh, time 
is what kind word would you like to express to the organizing committee for gathering us uh, today? So it's a word cloud. And personally, I would like to say thank you for gathering us today. This was an amazing work. Oh, merci. Thank you, you're awesome. That's it for me. So, uh, hi, I'm Christine Schwara. I'm with the uh, Swiss Data Science Center in Switzerland, and I'm uh, delighted to, uh, to present the next keynote, uh, Martin Morgan. So uh, Martin, uh, and I, we've known each other for a long time, so uh, Martin is a professor of oncology as at uh, Roswell Comprehensive uh, Cancer Center in Buffalo. He was trained um, in genetics and he's been a leading a bioconductor for, I think, over 10 years. And I, I assume that most of you are familiar with bioconductor, so, but they say don't make assumptions. So if you're not, bioconductor is this fantastic set of R tools to do genomic analysis. So if there's any way you are dealing with genomic data, there's a very high chance that um, it involves bioconductor. So I'm really delighted and I'm really looking forward to, uh, to hearing you more. Right, well, it's uh, great to be here and great to uh, have been invited by the organizers. I've been having a fantastic time in Toulouse and at the conference, and I'm glad to see that the uh, poster presenters are up here and have an even more challenging task than I do to present in a short period of time, whereas I can do my usual wander off in all kinds of different spaces. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to introduce uh, you to Bioconductor, and some of the unique features of the project, some of the things we do, and how a Bioconductor advances science and contributes to R. There are lots of uh, sort of familiar themes with, with other um, uh, keynote presentations and other phenomena at, going on at the, at the conference. And I actually wanted to do something completely risky. I wanted to just do my favorite thing, which is to share a few lines of, lines of code with you. So, Hopefully everything works out well. I'm just waiting for our studio, waiting for our studio to start up. And um, I'm, I'm being a little bit of a chicken here, so I've got my little script down below, and I'll just try and remember the magic thing to do. So actually, this is uh, I do a fair amount of teaching R, and uh, this is where I start. Uh, turns out that R is a calculator, and uh, it's always good to know that one plus two is equal to three. You know, this is part of the reproducibility idea that uh, is important. And uh, then the next line is this one, which uh, introduces uh, variables and, and uh, functions, and the fact that R is statistical, so generating 100 random normal deviates is just a matter of course, and uh, statistical programming language. And then the next thing is, you know, the, your boss or whatever, your teacher's always told you to look at your data, and I think of I think of this simple little histogram as a kind of an interactive graphic, not because you can interact with the graphic, but as you're exploring your data, you look at the histogram as a way of interacting with your, with your understanding. So then I wanted to go the next line, which is, uh, which is this one, which uh, takes our vector x and adds another 100 random normal deviates to it. And now we've got two variables x and y floating around in the global environment. But uh, 
they're not actually independent of one another. There's a mathematical relationship that we've described here. Um, one thing is that th this is a super expressive, you know, uh, phrase that I just wrote. I didn't have any for loops or no iterations or anything like that. There's actually a call to R norm, so that's like one function call, and plus is another function call, and then the assignment. And I've, uh, I've done a lot in that single line of code, it's, so it's super expressive, and it's fast. We could have changed 100 to a million, and we could still interact with those vectors. And this vectorized calculation is really important. So X and Y are now available in the global environment, but they're not really independent of one another, right? The first element of X has a special relationship with the first element of Y and the second element of X and the second element of Y. So what we'd really like to do is to, to put those together into some kind of data structure that helps us manage the known relationships between these types of data. So I create a data frame with two columns, X and Y. I guess I'm a little old school. I could have created a tibble, but we'll see, uh, see that in just a second, I guess, or some aspect of that. And uh, I was actually trained, my undergraduate degree was in botany. I was trained as a, as a classical plant ecologist. And as soon as I look at the data, I, I end up with a scatter plot where there's some kind of relationship between these two, two variables. And this gets me all excited. I think I'm going to publish in Nature or something like that. <laughs> it's, it's surely, it's just around the corner. And all I need to do is uh, fit a regression line. So I, so I fit my regression line. And if I, if I print it out fit, it would uh, print out, you probably know, it prints out some summary of the call that I made and the estimate of the intercept and the slope. But, um, and actually fit is a, a data frame is an object that we can kind of understand. And then fit is also, this variable fit is also an object returned by LM but it's got much more complicated structure. Some of the things we can guess at, some of the things if we have enough statistics, we can understand why, why they're there. But um, nothing that looks like the ANOVA table that I know that I'm going to have to present to my boss to convince him that this is really a fantastic finding. So it turns out that the way I interact with this object is by invoking uh, methods on it. And uh, here's my ANOVA table, a uh, little bit compressed, wrapped lines. I've got like the three three stars, so I know that I've got a really great uh, regression uh, thing. Nature is just around the corner. Uh, they're gonna, gonna do things. And then, then actually I, I realized that I should really add the regression line to my plot. And so I think of like layering uh, the regression line on top of the plot. Now I've got my regression line, my ANOVA, everything's great. Um, and the important you know, point through here is that I've been actually using these objects, a data frame that I can kind of understand, and a, this LM object that I don't really know the internals of, and I haven't been interacting with the internals of these objects. I've been using some kind of interface um, to extract information that's useful to me. But actually, one of the great things about R is, uh, is that it's extensible. You don't have to have to be a, a member of the secret inner circle. Um, um, to, um, which isn't uh, so secret, uh, to make uh, really valuable contributions. And another thing about uh, R in, and the package system in particular is it's a way to capture domain expertise and translate that domain expertise into software that's useful around uh, the world. And so actually I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the next thing. I'm going to load a particular library, which you probably probably recognize ggplot2. And uh, ggplot2 is actually, you and I think of it as a fantastic tool for visualization, but it's actually the result of, of Hadley's uh, PhD research. So his four years of academic research was uh, transformed into this package that he, that, um, he made available to us, and, uh, and we've benefited from that. So it's like a distillation of domain expertise into this package that's available. And that's really amazing. And each of us do that as we uh, move through the R ecosystem and mature from being uh, simple users and consumers to maybe making a package to share amongst our lab or our group of people and then with the wider community and having an impact that way. But of course, when you make an R package, you have a lot of, a lot of freedom to do what you want and to impose your own views on how things should work. So you bring a lot of your own personality to the, you know, uh, uh, your own personality to the 
uh, to the package. So like this idea that you have this thing called aesthetics and this geometries, these geomes, geome point and smooth, and that you can add these things, that this, is, this returns an object and you can add them together. The way that this is all laid out, the fact that we're doing exploratory data analysis so we don't come with some preconceived notion of what the relationship between these points are, all of that is the personality that the package developer has brought to, brought to bear on uh, presenting their domain expertise. So that's my little tour of, uh, of R, and I wanted to see if I can't not make a mess of these things and go back and, uh, to my talk <clears throat> and uh, use that to structure, structure my, my talk. We started with an old-fashioned calculator, statistical programming language, immediate visualization. We've had realized that R was expressive and vectorized. We uh, encountered objects and then uh, domain-specific understanding and personality. And so what I wanted to do was start with the domain-specific understanding that uh, is embodied in Bioconductor. And uh, to do that, <coughs> I need to introduce some, some background biology. Um, for me, uh, some of this is uh, second nature, but I know that many of you come from different disciplines, and it's uh, good to be on at least an approximate same page. So it turns out, according to uh, Google, there are um, 37 trillion, trillion cells in our, in our body, 37.2 trillion. I thought we could let the two, 200 billion, you know, what's 200 billion between friends? Uh, so 37 trillion cells in the human body, and then each cell has a full complement of DNA, and uh, DNA consists of 3 billion uh, nucleotides. So we've got 3 billion nucleotides in each of our cells. And uh, these nucleotides are assembled into these molecules, these DNA molecules. You probably remember this, um, DNA molecules, and, uh, and grouped into chromosomes and so on. And uh, the DNA is, of course, the material that's transmitted between generations. Mutations in the DNA contribute to the diversity that we see in this room and around the world. Um, when we look at the uh, particular regions of the DNA, we find genes that are expressed. They're uh, transcribed from DNA. Uh, here's a double-stranded DNA molecule. You probably remember DNA double-stranded. There are these four, four nucleotides, A, T, G, and C, and then there, this strand, uh, oops, spoiling the punchline here. Oh, geez, now I've gone way, way fast. Uh, yeah, let's try this again. Yes, so uh, this strand here and the complementary st strand here, A's pairs with T's and uh, G's pairs with, pair with C's. These are the nucleotides. The DNA is uh, transcribed into messenger RNA, RNA which is uh, related. This is a single, messenger RNA is a st single stranded molecule, not quite so stable. And the messenger RNA, you probably remember, um, has a similar set of nucleotides, a different alphabet. Um, and the uh, triplets of the messenger RNA are translated into these amino acids, which form uh, polypeptide change with chains, which form uh, uh, proteins, which um, perform biochemical actions in each of our cells and are the reason why we're alive. So a very fundamental question in biology is to uh, try and estimate or characterize the levels of protein expression in each of our cells or uh, some approximation of that. And it turns out that it's very difficult to estimate uh, the uh, protein concentration. But these messenger RNAs, you can actually extract them from the cell. You can fragment them into pieces of uh, th 300 nucleotides, say. And to uh, take those nucleotides, you can actually sequence those uh, fragments. So you end up knowing that you've got a fragment of 300 nucleotides long, you knowing the DNA sequence of that 300 nucleotide fragment. And you can take that fragment and place it somewhere on the three, 3 billion nucleotides in the genome and know that that fragment originally came from some gene. And you can repeat that, say, tens of millions of times. And you can think of like uh, looking along a chromosome and finding these piles of fragments, and the size of the pile of the fragment is proportional to how expressed that particular gene at that location was. 
So you can actually quantify levels of gene expression using this, uh, this uh, process. It's called RNA, -se RNA sequencing. You start with the messenger RNA. You amplify the messenger individual molecules of messenger RNA enough so that you can sequence them, and then you map the sequenced uh, uh, molecules back to the genome and use that to count. So that's actually been the paradigm over the last uh, seven or eight years to use uh, RNA-seq. But these technologies all have a, a lifespan, and very clever people always come up with better ideas. And the current sort of approach is something called single-cell sequencing, which is even more radical. So the idea is uh, what I just described was kind of bulk RNA sequencing. You'd sample a, a bunch of tissue and extract, sort of like get the average signal from a bunch of cells, like tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of cells. You'd get the average signal from those cells. But it turns out that you can actually take uh, individual cells and, uh, and, uh, and then sequence the, the DNA in those, the expressed DNA in those individual cells. And uh, I was thinking that this is probably, probably, you know, those Google self-driving cars, you know, they're probably engineers who figure out how to drive the self-driving cars. And probably there's some engineers whose cars never get out of the Google parking lot. You know, they keep right, driving into the, the barriers or something like that because they kind of design things wrong. So, um, so what we've got here is uh, these individual cells, and they're kind of moving in this direction in a microfluidic chamber. And then you've got these guys here, which are um, very small uh, microparticles that have uh, DNA attached to them. And they're moving in the opposite direction or a perpendicular direction. And uh, the idea is to get these guys in close enough pr proximity as they go through this uh, intersection. So instead of trying to avoid collisions, the idea is to kind of arrange for the collisions. So uh, the cell and the and single microparticle get in close proximity, and they, um, they move through, and then an oil uh, substance creates these little droplets. And uh, this droplet consists of one of these microparticles with uh, some DNA on it and the individual cell. And then inside this micro, uh, inside this little droplet, this, the uh, chemistry is such that the cell uh, uh, lyse, lyses, so it degrades, and the DNA, or the, sorry, the mRNA from the uh, expressed genes binds to the complementary nucleotides on the microparticle. And then what you've got associated with this microparticle is the DNA from this particular cell. And the DNA on the microparticle has a little barcode that uniquely identifies it. So you know that uh, the, the fragments from uh, this microparticle are different, uh, came from a different cell than the fragments on this microparticle. So you can actually sequence the uh, expressed genes of individual cells. So instead of doing this sort of bulk average sequencing, you get the expressed genes of individual cells. It's totally amazing uh, what you can do. There's a reference there if you're interested in pursuing it a little bit. Um, and then what you end up with, you do the same kind of thing. You group the sequenced uh, expressed microRNAs, you align them to the reference genome, and you count how many times a particular gene, so here's a, a gene, ENSG001, just made up. And uh, this 679 means that the 679 fragments from this particular cell um, aligned over this gene, whereas 448 uh, fragments from this cell aligned over this gene. So like if you just kind of looked at this uncritically, you'd say, oh, this, the gene was expressed more in this cell than in this cell, and uh, even more so in this cell, whereas this gene, ENSG002, wasn't expressed in any of those cells. So are you able to assay the level of expression in the cells. Notice that this uh, genes, by, genes by samples is actually the transpose of the way most statisticians would think of presenting their data, even in the pre-tidy uh, universe, uh, that usually you'd think of samples as rows. Um, but there are tons of really interesting statistical questions. So first of all, there are about uh, uh, 20 to 30,000 genes. So you've got 20 to 30,000 um, columns. And then the number of cells, uh, you know, initially were 10 or 20,000. Uh, maybe 50,000 is fairly typical now, but the, you can have up to millions of these cells, so you can have millions of columns. So you have this 
pretty large count matrix, and you want to do all kinds of interesting things from a statistical and a uh, research question challenge. So um, you might be interested in clustering the samples to identify different cell types. You might be uh, interested in characterizing expression in of a particular gene in different subpopulations of cells. Uh, one early and pretty exciting um, application of this uh, type of technology is that cells often go through uh, cycles, and you'd like to be able to track the progression of the patterns of gene expression as the cell goes through some, say, developmental cycle. So you might be interested in imposing a time course on top of the uh, classification or the clustering here. Or you might be interested in measuring differential expression of genes and associating the expression of a particular gene with a particular phenotype. So these are all really interesting statistical challenges and research questions. So um, uh, you can kind of just get a sense of the data. It's very large primary data. DNA sequence reads uh, tens of millions of, of these fragments. It's often reduced for analysis into these uh, matrices of counts that might be on this order of magnitude. The largest to date is about 28,000 genes by 1.3 million cells. And both the genes and the samples have information. We saw the samples had information about which, uh, which cells they came from, but the cells might have come from different treatments and might have been processed in different batches and so on. So you have annotations on the, on the samples and also on the genes that you're trying to keep track of. And the analysis that you're going to apply to these things is inherently statistical. Often you're working with designed experiments. There are these technological and other artifacts that lead to batch effects and differences in the total number of reads that you sequence from different samples that are unrelated to patterns of gene expression. The data actually turns out to be really sparse and follow unique distributions. And usually you have large P, many genes, and small n, small samples. And even in this case of the 1.3 million cells, actually those 1.3 million cells came from only two mice. So at the, at the mouse level, you have a sample size of two, and you're trying to arrive at statistical conclusions. So you can appreciate that there's significant statistical uh, challenges, and also the data is comparatively big. <clears throat> and then the final thing is that we as st uh, statisticians or bioinformaticians are often working in groups, and so we want to communicate our results to other members of our team. And uh, we want to do that in a reproducible way, so when our paper really does go to nature and it comes back three months later and the reviewer says, this doesn't look right, we can look at what we did and say, yes, you're right, we made a, a mistake at this point here. Um, and, uh, and, and fix it, or, or be able to argue for why our approach is correct. And so we'd like to be able to do a reproducible analysis. We'd like to be able to translate our statistical findings about these individual uh, samples into things that the biologists that we're working with will understand, like uh, different gene identifiers or the pathways that the, that the uh, genes whose expression we've measured belong to, or perhaps identify drug targets or whatnot. And then we'd like to communicate these results in an effective way with visual summaries, reports, slides, and interactive apps like this IC that I think uh, Frederico talked about in a previous session today. <clears throat> so this is uh, what Bioconductor turns out to be about, the statistical analysis and comprehension of high-throughput genomic data. And uh, the high-throughput genomic data is a single cell or bulk sequencing data. Um, expression, methylation, SNP, and other microarrays. Microarrays are an older technology, but they still provide a cost-effective way of doing, uh, addressing many uh, interesting questions. And then other uh, high-throughput methodologies in flow cytometry, proteomics, and so on. The project is actually funded by the U.S. NIH. Uh, we've received funding in the past from the European Union and more recently from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Um, to support a small professional team of developers working in an academic environment. And uh, the real scientific progress, in some ways the core team, uh, provides the infrastructure on which uh, the real uh, scientific progress uh, can be made, and that's uh, done through the broader developer and user uh, community. And most importantly, Bioconductor has a collection of stickers that many of you in the audience could add to your collection and weigh down your laptop. Um, yeah. So that's, that's the uh, domain-specific understanding. I wanted to just briefly go through the uh, personality of Bioconductor. 
we have a, our own website, bioconductor.org. Bioconductor was established in uh, 2001 by Robert Gentleman and a, a dozen other colleagues. Um, Robert was one of the authors of R. Um, there are now 1,750 R software packages. We passed a watershed mark last year with a half a million unique IP uh, downloads um, per year, which is probably more than the size of the bioinformatics population, but I guess bioinformaticians download software from more than just their lab computers. It's uh, got lots of uh, traction in the academic uh, literature, and uh, more than 1,200 individual maintainers have contributed packages to, to Bioconductor. Each of our packages is arranged in a kind of hierarchy, and you can navigate to the packages of interest. We have these software packages, but also packages that are pure data packages that contain information about uh, the genes and the pathways that were, are being assayed. And we have these experimental data packages, which are like uh, collections of experiments that can be used in teaching or for reproducible research. Recently, we've introduced workflows that take uh, newer users from end to end of a new um, of a particular analysis pathways. All of our packages have landing pages. This is a landing page for DESeq2, a very popular package. You see there are, there are badges here that people can uh, use to inform their assessment of the package, whether it's available on all platforms, how frequently it's downloaded, whether it's supported actively, how long it's been in Bioconductor, so is it a mature or not so mature, whether it's currently building okay across all of our platforms, when it was last updated, and then a new, new, new badge, uh, the number of dependencies that the package has, and generally having dependencies is good, so you reuse software, but having too many dependencies makes it, um, the, your package particularly fragile and susceptible to changes in other underlying packages. And then it has, uh, each of the landing pages has a, typically citations either of the package or of the um, scientific paper that supports it. Each package has a DOI. Um, there are installation instructions. And then a unique feature of bioconductor packages are the, is the requirement for vignettes that are actively evaluated, so that have code chunks that are actively evaluated. We have a Stack Overflow style support forum. And uh, for our um, sort of transition user developer, um, uh, people who are fully engaged in the project, we have a community Slack that's turned out to be totally, totally uh, interesting and useful, sometimes talking about um, our conferences. Uh, this uh, HCA RFA was a, a grant proposal that a, a postdoc uh, wrestled uh, eight, uh, eight of us into uh, proposing. Uh, this GSEA base is a conversation between one of the developers on the Bioconductor project, Kayla Morrell, and two other people in the community who are all working on similar projects. And uh, the IC app that we mentioned just uh, the other minute is, uh, was developed largely through um, Slack. So it's a very interactive and supportive community. We have some unique features that sometimes cause problems. So let me see where I'm at. Uh, yes. Um, uh, you might know that CRAN has yearly releases and that when you have a package in CRAN, the source code is used to build under these versions of various versions of R. Um, Bioconductor and the science that we support moves faster than CRAN, so we have a six-month release cycle and um, we have separate repositories for each of our releases. And there's a kind of a leading developer branch where you introduce new features that might break things, but it doesn't matter because they'll be fixed by the time the release comes around, or you might uh, introduce new features. And then every six months, the develop branch rolls over to a stable release branch and uh, can be used by the broader user community. We have a special way to install packages. Um, our packages are actually managed under our own version control, so when you contribute a package to Bioconductor, it isn't a tarball, we actually clone your Git repository, and then our, for our purposes, the canonical location of your package is in our Git. Um, we have nightly builds, and new packages are actually added to the project through a review process that involves uh, opportunity for public, uh, it's a public review process uh, conducted through GitHub issues. These are the issues that I'm currently responsible for. You can see that uh, the red things mean that it's in the uh, 
uh, contributors court to fix problems that are uh, coming up. And the goal of the review is not so much to uh, ensure the quality of the science, but to make sure, which is the job of the scientific community, but to make sure that the uh, packages are um, at a, uh, uh, can, uh, we've improved the package's technical quality as, uh, as much as possible. <clears throat> so our uh, personality then has a broad global user base, a supportive community uh, for both users and developers. Extensive, tested, maintained, and supported software. This unique, stable release branch and flexible, innovative develop branch that allows us to move forward at a steady pace without disrupting people's work, and a large scientific and professional impact. Okay, so that's like the personality. The, the, those were the touchy-feely things, and now I wanted to get into some technical stuff. So this is the hardest technical part of the talk. And uh, many, in many ways, most interesting. And I'll just remind you that um, when we had these two vectors, x and y, in the little uh, walkthrough, that those variables were uh, uh, independent of one another, and there is great value in putting them into an object, a data frame, to coordinate the way that we manipulated those objects. And then when we fit the linear model, we uh, recognized that the internal structure of the object was kind of too complicated for us as users, and instead we interacted with it using. Uh, methods like ANOVA and ABLINE. Um, so, so those are kind of things to think about and what I wanted to think about from the bioconductor's perspective is how we got into our reliance on objects. And um, this kind of uh, diagram just outlines a common workflow. You start with some big data and kind of move down from the, through the blue boxes, FASTQ to BAM files. And then there are a number of different analyses that you might take uh, going across the page that illustrate different ways in which you might uh, analyze the data. And then in the red boxes are the packages in Bioconductor that you might use for each of those steps in the analysis. And you can see that any analysis might use several different packages, and uh, that across each of these paths you might use a, quite a collection of packages. And it'd be a real uh, unfortunate waste of time if you spent most of your time translating the data formats between packages to make, the, make them interoperable. So during the exploratory phrase, when you apply different approaches to the same data, you'd like to easily apply the different approaches without having to worry about wrangling the data into shape. And then in the mature phase where you've decided on your analysis pipeline, you want to be able to apply the same approach to many different data sets. So you shape it into the right shape at the front end and then it flows through in a structured way throughout. You'd also like the... Um, data that you're working with, because it's large and complicated, you'd like the representations to be robust. So you'd like the data to be validated, and you'd like to be able to easily manage complicated objects, like the count matrix and the data frame that describes the samples in that count matrix. And then as a bonus, if everyone's using the same data representations, then the subtle bugs that are only discovered after a thousand people use it are actually discovered because a thousand people have used the container. So there's some strong reasons to want inter interoperable and robust software. And we've used S4 classes extensively. I'm just illustrating a simple S4 class, this DNA string set. It represents a sequence of, uh, a, a collection of DNA sequences. There are uh, 26,000 of them, and each of them are 2,000 nucleotides long. And uh, when you create a DNA string set, the data is validated. So you can't put any letter into a DNA string set. You can only put in nucleotides and other letters of the IUPAC alphabet so that you have data validation. And then uh, there are things that you want to do with a DNA sequence that you wouldn't want to do with a regular uh, character vector. Uh, for instance, you'd like to cal often calculate the reverse complement of a sequence. So look at the very last uh, nucleotides here. We have... We have uh, backwards T, G, G, C, and uh, you'd like to reverse the string, so the T, the T becomes first, T, G, G, C become the first letters, and then complement them. So the complement of uh, T is A, and the complement of G is C. So this, the reverse complement of this string would be uh, uh, A, C, C, G, and here's A, C, C, G. So that's called reverse complement, and it's an operation that clearly you'd like to do with DNA sequences, but you wouldn't like to do with um, regular sentences, although it could be an interesting game to play, kind of fun. 
And there's a friendly interface as well that's available. So actually, the display is more or less like this. You don't actually get 2,000 characters across the screen, and you don't actually get 26,454 character vectors printed out on the screen. You get about a screenful's worth of screen when you print the object. So there's a friendly interface, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later. And the friendly interface kind of masks uh, sophisticated uh, implementation that goes on under the hood, where the developer is faced with the challenge of storing a very large collection of uh, DNA sequences in a memory efficient manner that facilitates interactions with uh, these uh, domain specific um, methods. And so there's a real interest in separating out the gory details of the implementation from the way that the user interacts with them. So uh, DNA string set is a major uh, class. Another one that's really important is called this uh, G ranges. This is a G ranges here. This is the coordinates in genome space of uh, uh, chromosome 12 at these coordinates on the plus strand. This information is uh, required, some additional optional information. It, uh, there are subtle things about these uh, genomic ranges. About half of the bioinformatics community starts counting at zero, the other starts counting at one, so the first nucleotide is zero or one, depending on whether you're on the west coast of the U.S. or in Europe. And then another uh, division is uh, whether the, this interval represents an open interval, a half open interval or a closed interval. So some people would think of this 1, 8 here as being on the outside, the outside the interval, so it's a half open interval. But uh, other people would think of it as being a closed interval. So for bioconductor, these G ranges are interpreted as closed intervals where you start counting at 1. And by using this uh, container, you're uh, adopting that. Um, that uh, convention and some of the convention is enforced as much as possible. It's very important to know what genome this represents. So chromosome 12 on a human is very different from chromosome 12 on a pig. So you find out that this, you have some metadata that's associated with these um, gen genomic ranges. This is from a build of the human genome. And then the final thing is that uh, this sort of looks like it's two-dimensional, like it looks like a data frame, but actually this information here, chromosome 12, blah, 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 is really a tuple, you know, and what you really have is a vector of tuples. And uh, so this genomic range is actually a vector, and even though it's sort of displayed as a uh, two-dimensional structure. <clears throat> uh, the summarized experiment, I'm going to just, I'm kind of running a little bit late, of course. So this is a, this is a summarized experiment, and it's a, a data container that we use to um, hold experimental results that have relational constraints between the components of the result. So that count matrix that we saw earlier is, would uh, belong in this assay location, and the information about the samples, what cells they came from, what treatments they belong to, belong in a data frame uh, that's associated with this um, object. To give you a little bit more of a sense of what's going on here, here's our count matrix, and here's our samples. They're independent of one another. Just as we put those two vectors together to form a data frame, we want to put these two objects together so that when we manage the object, subset it, for instance, we do it in a coordinated fashion. So we create our summarized experiment. We can extract, say, the assays and calculate the column sums, which is a useful uh, st uh, description called a library size. So you can do operations like that, or you could um, use uh, some convenient uh, notation to reach in to this sample data frame and extract this information for the DEX column, choose the samples that belong to this untreated group, and use that to subset the summarized experiment to arrive at the set of samples, both the counts and their descriptions, corresponding to the untreated uh, group of samples. So you're actually able to do these complicated manipulations in a very familiar and uh, friendly R um, fashion. You know, I'm going to skip this, but it's uh, quite interesting. S4 vectors um, is kind of a natural outgrowth of these ideas, and uh, the notion that actually um, you can think about uh, data structures um, in a kind of an abstract philosophical way, like what is a vector? Well, a vector is something that has a length and that you can uh, subset with a single square bracket and has names. What is a list? Well, you can do everything that you can do with a vector, but you can also do it with, uh, you can also ask about its lengths, uh, plural, and you can use a double square bracket to extract individual elements. Now, you could ask about, well, what is 
this object called a data frame. It's uh, got some properties, but a data frame column in particular, you can put anything into a data frame column that is, satisfies the, uh, the, the vector um, characteristics. And uh, so, for instance, you create a DNA string set and a G ranges object that we've seen. It turns out that the DNA uh, string set is a vector, the G ranges is a vector, so you can put these complicated objects into a data frame and then manipulate them in a coordinated fashion. Uh, if you try to do that in BASAR, the, both of these objects would be coerced to character vectors or um, atomic vectors, and you'd lo lose the semantic meaning of a genomic ranges or a DNA string set. If you tried to put them into a tibble, it would uh, the Tibble would complain that they weren't 1D or 2D objects. So objects encourage interoperability between uh, packages. They provide robust validation. They enable easy management of complex relational data. And then we haven't really dwelled on it, but they separate the interface experienced by the user, all of those kind of friendly ways of working with the data, from the implementation that's available to the developer. So objects turn out to be really important. All right, so I wanted to say a few words about old-fashioned calculator statistical programming. So I was thinking about this in Joe's talk today about reproducibility and how, um, how we're, um, how uh, a, a challenge in, in these, intera in these uh, visual applications is reproducibility where it falls very naturally from writing scripts, right? Um, and uh, an Im important uh, components of, uh, re of reproducibility and communication come from um, aspects that are uh, at the core of uh, uh, Bioconductor's approach. Uh, the first thing is that these uh, vignettes that are included in uh, Bioconductor packages are fully uh, computer computable, um, and they're required of all uh, Bioconductor packages. Uh, this is uh, just a random uh, package, GWAS Survivor. It's been in uh, BioC for uh, less, than a, less than a year, so it's a new package. Uh, by a couple of authors who I met uh, in a coffee shop. Um, and uh, this uh, link, HTML, leads to their vignette, which describes how the package is supposed to be used. The vignette contains code chunks that are fully evaluated, and so it gives you confidence that the package is going to do what it says it's going to do. There are these comprehensive workflows that's hiding behind the GWAS survivor landing page. This documentation is a, a workflow where the author of the workflow has developed 12 chapters of a uh, vignette, fully evaluated vignette, that describe uh, working with uh, single cell data. We've also got these workshop compendia from our most recent conference and other community developed material like OSCA, the um, Orchestrating Single Cell Analysis, which is a, a book length treatment of analysis of uh, single cell data that was uh, developed by um, two authors. Uh, two, two members of the bioconductor community in particular. Uh, bioconductor also provides a path, you know, much like Hadley's development of ggplot2 translated his academic research into impact that was broader than it would have otherwise been. Uh, there are paths to academic uh, recognition uh, in the publication of individual packages. They have a, a digital object identifier. They have the citations both to the package itself and to literature that might be supporting it. And then we have a unique relationship with uh, the F, uh, Faculty of 1000 Research uh, publication journal where you can take a bioconductor uh, package or markdown document, uh, maybe typically a, a workflow, and uh, submit it to F1000 Research. Initially, the editors would then take that and convert it to Word or whatever it was that they're dealing with and edit it and send you back this marked up PDF, say, and fix these things. But actually, they've been trained to work with Markdown. And so the, you submit Markdown, they make the Markdown changes and, uh, and then publish on F1000 Research a uh, fully reproducible document that's backed by a uh, vignette, a c computed vignette. So it's totally neat. I'm going to switch to uh, the next part of the talk here, um, challenges and opportunities. I've kind of circled this line of expressive and vectorized. So the notion that you s want your software to remain e easy to use uh, in this expressive kind of sense, and you also want it to be performant. And those are significant challenges that, that we face. 
So the first thing I wanted to mention was how we work with very large data sets. Um, for instance, this 10x brain data uh, package has a, an on-disk summarized experiment. It has 28,000 ro rows, 1.3 million columns. You can load it uh, with those lines of code and you interact with it uh, more or less immediately. But most of the data remains on disk in its original format. And then when you display the assay, which is the big data, the rectangular count data, it doesn't actually show the whole data, it just shows sort of the four corners of the matrix. And so when you add one to it and take the log, what it does is it adds one and takes the log of the four corners of the matrix. And so it's super fast, so you interact with it in a way that you think is, the, you, you can tell whether you're making mistakes, um, but uh, you're actually uh, working with it interactively. Take a sample, subset the, the large object, you still have most of the data on disk. The next line, this uh, sum of the sample actually reads in the data from disk and tells us that actually the, the data is incredibly sparse, 92% of the cells are zeros. Um, and, uh, and then this uh, is another example where you need to realize the data. I should have really uh, used the full data set here. And uh, under the hood, the realization and the computation of the column sums is done in, in a batch-wise processing of the matrix, reading in chunks of the matrix. And then the column sums are computed in parallel so that the um, computation is relatively fast and all of this chunk-wise parallel processing is transparent to the user. A second really challenging and exciting area, I think, uh, for the project and for our, our uh, community in general is the increasing availability of cloud resources. I'm uh, just mentioning here on this slide uh, the, the Anvil Cloud, which is an effort uh, uh, spearheaded by the U.S. National Human Genome Research Initiative. The idea is that uh, they already have these very large data resources in the cloud, and uh, they also have uh, some uh, computational resources that are also available in the cloud, and it makes a lot of sense to be able to access the uh, cloud-based data resources from the cloud-based computational resources. So that means moving our typical use of Bioconductor and R, which is on a laptop or maybe on a university computer, into a cloud-based environment. And maybe also interacting much more with the other tools that are also available in the cloud. And this brings a lot of um, benefits to uh, Bioconductor, to our use of R. Um, it actually simplifies things because the complicated aspects of installing packages and configuring systems for parallel evaluation is all put on the shoulders of the people who are deploying the cloud and not on the user. You just have to point your browser to the right location. It's also fast because you're on these compute resources that are managed in the same uh, resource uh, center and scalable because you can spin up many different instances and have access to uh, compute power that you don't have in, um, in, in your own environment. And then Anvil is very concerned about uh, um, access to appropriate data, so this is a secure environment for computation. So this cloud stuff is really interesting. And then the final thing I wanted to uh, talk about in terms of challenges is uh, alternative paradigms in R um, from the S4-based approach that Bioconductor has adopted uh, so far. And I'll just talk about tidy data um, for a, for a second or so and contrast tidy data with some of the things we've seen in our S4 objects where we have this sort of generalized vectors like DNA string set and G ranges and these structured efficient matrix representations that are coordinated between the matrix and, and the annotations on the rows and columns and having this coordinated multiple table representation and, uh, and the relational idea there. So the matrix as an efficient representation and the relational aspects of summarized experiment. And uh, so Airway is a, one of these experiment data packages that contains a summarized experiment and assay pulls out the, sum, the matrix representation of those count matrices. And then this dot, dot, dot is a, a new function for the, for the tidy people. It says, and a miracle happens. You go from a matrix to a, a tidy tibble and then you, um, which isn't too much of a miracle, but um, I like the idea of having a dot, dot, dot as a new function. I think it would be a great idea. It would ir really irritate uh, some of the stalwarts in the community. Um, 
and and um, and then uh, and then uh, use the standard tidyverse uh, operations to calculate the library size, and then the next one is uh, some. Uh, version of what I would have done in the old way, I would have taken the call sums of the assay of the airway, and I probably would have nested it you know, in that inside out logic. But there's nothing to stop us from piping the assay of airway to call sums. And then we can also learn the lesson of the tidyverse and the value of having uh, Tibble-like data structures when uh, convenient. So maybe I'd turn the named uh, vector that call sums returns into a, into a Tibble that has sample and library size that I could then use tidy operations on. So there's an <clears throat> interesting interplay between the paradigm that we've adopted and uh, the paradigms that are uh, other paradigms in the R community. So if I were to just um, summarize uh, some of the um, challenges and opportunities, we have issues with dealing with large data on our uh, laptops and in our um, uh, analyses that we're doing in a local environment. There are tremendous opportunities for cloud-based computation, especially containerization, uh, fast uh, data access, and scalability. And then working well with other parts of the ever-evolving R and broader um, ecosystems. I talked uh, in particular about the tidyverse in the previous slide, but the tons of uh, large-scale machine learning algorithms are implemented in Python and uh, cloud-based access is increasingly important for um, performing the computations that are uh, relevant for the size of data that we're working with. So there are lots of opportunities for working with other parts of the evolving R and broader ecosystems. So I'm going to just summarize now and then acknowledge, <laughs> excuse me, and then um, entertain any questions. So, uh, <clears throat> so we kind of had this overall structure of an introduction to R, and we went from uh, basic statistical programming language, the idea that objects and organizing data into objects is important, and the tremendous value that packages uh, provide as a way to translate domain-specific knowledge into practical application, and the personality that's involved there. So I talked about high-throughput genomics as the domain-specific knowledge that Bioconductor provides, a little bit about the Bioconductor ecosystem to give you a sense of the project, I talked about the S4 objects and interdependent packages as a way of uh, arriving at robust and interoperable solutions, uh, talked very briefly about reproducibility and communicating results, and finally uh, summarized some of the challenges and opportunities that exist. <clears throat> I'll just uh, conclude by acknowledging the tremendous contributions of uh, people in the core team and uh, close collaborators. Uh, Hervé, Marcel, Daniel, Jin, uh, Lori, Nitesh, uh, Kayla, and Jeffe. Um, we're funded by the U.S. National Institutes of Health, the European Union, uh, Chan Zuckerberg. The worldwide uh, community of users and developers is incredibly important uh, to Bioconductor. And then we have a technical and scientific advisory board who uh, keep us on the straight and narrow, and I'm very grateful for their uh, contributions to the project. This is my formal acknowledgement slide, and I'm happy to stop and entertain a few questions while we have a bit of time. So, uh, can you hear? Yeah. So the first, so the most popular question here is about uh, reviewing packages. So public review is very cool. Any negative experience you could share? Um, mostly the experience has been positive, actually. Uh, um, it's, uh, in some ways, the review process is quite time consuming for the core team who does the, does, does the reviews. Um, we haven't had, um, 
we haven't had instances of, say, people uh, from the broader community um, piling on a, pa a package that they felt was inadequate or something like that. Um, the usual sort of thing that happens with a package that doesn't end up in bioconductor is that the, during the review process, some points are, some you know, technical points are raised about how the package is structured, and the author is asked to revise it. And they frequently, well, in the cases where the package doesn't end up in, in bioconductor, I think that they realize that they're in over their heads, that they've produced a, a package that was uh, 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 good for a particular purpose within their lab, but it wasn't really robust enough for broader use. And um, maybe also they've been uh, engaged in a short-term project where the goal was to produce a package to submit to bioconductor, and then they've really moved on. Their interests have really moved on. So those are the types of things that um, sort of move packages outside of bioconductor, uh, you know, not, 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 not ending up in bioconductor. Um, but generally, the public review process has been very helpful. Usually, the reviews are, as I say, are conducted by the core team. But um, occasionally, uh, someone uh, with expertise from the outside, uh, outside of the core team chimes in, usually with extremely constructive and insightful comments um, that uh, improve the overall project. And usually, the um, feedback that we get from package authors uh, is uh, grat uh, gratitude for us having taken the time to improve their uh, software in tangible ways. Um, so usually, it's a very positive experience. Thanks. So thanks. So another one about um, so what's your what's your take on bioinformatics packages that are on CRAN and not on Bioconductor? Yeah, it's uh, great. I, uh, in some ways, um, in some ways, uh, the, some aspects of Bioconductor are um, important for the project as a whole, like this idea that we'll use a common set of uh, classes and that the packages are striving to be um, compatible with one another. And sometimes that goal of uh, inter interoperable, robust interoperable packages is uh, tangential to the main goal of, um, of the package author. Maybe they've developed a, stati a primarily statistical method that they want to use the package to showcase. And the, um, the value of that statistical method um, doesn't require the uh, supporting infrastructure of Bioconductor. And so the package ends up on CRAN and not Bioconductor. And I think that's great. That's a really appropriate um, uh, division um, of, um, of, uh, uh, of packages. In some ways, we're in no shortage of uh, software within the project. And so it's, um, there's n n n no, no harm or um, no ill feeling from packages that end up in CRAN. Uh, the, the only thing that sometimes is irritating is when people ask for support of, uh, on our support site for a non-bioconductor non package. But that's usually irritating because you know that they're going to be disappointed because the author of the non-bioconductor package doesn't follow the bioconductor support forum. And um, so they won't get a, a prompt answer. On the other hand, there's one notable package that is a CRAN package. The uh, developer is extremely involved in the support site, and he gets tons of questions there. And it's always a little bit perplexing about why he hasn't um, opted for uh, uh, contributing to Bioconductor. But all's fair. It's, uh, it's great that um, his software is providing a useful service, um, and he's able to support users that overlap with Bioconductor through the support site. So it seems that the next is a thank you note. Well, it's, it's a thank you note. So you're actually working to save lives, which is great. So, um, uh, and the, uh, so the next one is, yeah, can I, can I use Bioconductor to play with my own data from 23andMe or a service like that? Uh, yeah, so uh, it's kind of interesting. So uh, um, the, the 23andMe data are available uh, in formats that you could definitely parse into R and represent in, with some of the data representations that we've talked about. And you could learn a ton of information about the SNPs or, that they've identified. Um, and so you could actually uh, do that. And there's a great blog post, uh, but you'll have to sort of search for 23andMe R um, blog. 
maybe Stephen Turner, I'm not sure who wrote the blog, uh, that talks about uh, actually using R and, bio, and partly Bioconductor for interpreting their 23andMe data. So uh, definitely possible to, to have a lot of fun with that. Um, one of my colleagues, uh, uh, maybe as a thank you gift, I guess, uh, to, a, to a, a visit he, um, he made to, uh, to uh, the Beijing Genome Institute, which did much of the sequencing of the human genome, as kind of a thank you gift, he received his, he had his DNA sequence. So he's got a thumb drive on his desk with his entire DNA sequence uh, sitting there. He's afraid to look at it and figure out what's going on. So two, two questions that are very related. Uh, so are there requirements to upload a package to Bioconductor similar to Crown, and are there requirements uh, from Bioconductor that you think or you hope that Crown uh, would adopt? <clears throat> The, one of the main differences um, for uh, bioconductor packages is the use of this computable um, vignette, the requirement of a computable vignette. And a second differentiator is really reuse where appropriate of uh, bioconductor objects and classes and existing infrastructure packages. Um, and that really, um, are, those are the sorts of requirements that differentiate bioconductor from, from CRAN. I've got to say that CRAN does a fantastic job of, it, of you know, programmatically ensuring the uh, uh, correctness of uh, packages. Um, we have a package called BioC Check, and I guess it's a, that, so when you submit a package to Bioconductor, it goes through our command check, and then it goes through our command BioC Check. And the things that BioC Check uh, identifies are more uh, say programming issues, at least some of them are programming issues that maybe are, are um, important, particularly when working with large data, for instance. And they might be a little bit uh, controversial or more like, I don't think CRAN, CRAN has a very s strong, uh, clear, precise idea of what a good package is. And I think our, our kind of definition of a good package is built on that well-defined CRAN package, plus softer criteria, like, for instance, the use of vApply as opposed to sApply, uh, which is a kind of a technical thing, um, but uh, th that, um, that are maybe uh, more, they're softer requirements and they're um, Im important for our concern about the overall quality and interoperability of our packages. Um, I'm not sure that I'd uh, want to see those um, approaches adopted by uh, CRAN, and I can appreciate why CRAN wouldn't want to do things like having computable vignettes, and I can certainly understand why CRAN wouldn't want to insist that all packages used a finite set of objects to represent the diversity of um, data types. So in many ways, CRAN's doing a great job and glad to be able to build on top of their uh, package check requirements. And I think, I think we have time for one more question, uh, which is the, the most active parts of development in Bioconductor. Yeah, uh, yeah, so actually these uh, single cell analyses are very hot these days. Uh, single cell RNA-seq, um, so getting insights at the single cell level. It's also very important uh, these days, uh, you can perform many different types of genomic assays on the same or overlapping sets of samples. So maybe you have gene expression and copy number variation and uh, actual DNA sequence variation. And the integration of those different data sets is extremely interesting and important. And then there's always this move uh, from these uh, proxies for gene expression, which is what mRNA is, to actual proteomics and, uh, uh, and uh, related fields. So proteomics is actually quite uh, an important uh, emerging area within uh, Bioconductor and the field at large. So, so I, th I think we don't have time for more questions, but I would like uh, to thank Martin for this great presentation. Just before Dirk, I would like to uh, remind all the flash, flash poster presenters to come front to their reserved seats, and especially people from um, 
group A, such as Cécile Chauvel. So please come and uh, take your seat. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm, absolutely. I'll just br bring the slides up so I pretend I'm not here. Oops. Okay, so just to give a little explanation of, of this, um, a bit closer to the mic, this uh, more unusual addition to the program. Uh, a, f a few years ago, uh, an initiative began in France to collect, uh, preserve, and share free and open source software. And uh, Dirk Edelbutel um, has a connection to the project, and because we were having the user in France, and Dirk is here, we thought it would be a nice opportunity uh, for him to talk a bit more about how this project um, relates to the R community, and um, you know that, that how it might uh, we might collaborate in future. Thanks, Dirk. Yeah. Good afternoon and hello, and thanks for staying. And um, big thanks from me to the organizers for letting this in on relatively short notice. I'll talk in a minute about how this came together. So it's something that, just like Heather, I had known about for a few years and had in the back of my mind that I should put some work on, in on connecting our world with their system, and then it, then it just happened. So I put my name on as well as Stefano's name, and I'll talk a bit about um, who Stefano is in a second. Um, and sort of just to clarify, I'm not taking any credit here for any of the insanely impressive work by Software Heritage. I'm not part of that team. And I've just sort of helped them because I was an R conduit. Stefano and I know each other through joint Debian work. And so it all started with a tweet, which basically said, yo, we have some stuff. We want to add CRAN. How do we do it? And that's, by and large, how I've helped this summer. So, but I'll talk a bit more about that. But before I get to that, uh, a few things um, about software heritage, why and how. And uh, they were very kind and gave me their very impressive um, Beamer repo. But most of the things I've taken are straight up screenshots from their website. The URL is at the bottom. I invite you to peruse the website. Um, at the top is a banner of four charts, and I'm just going to th through all of these. And it's, of course, uh, a very uncontroversial statement to say at a conference dedicated to computational statistics and statistical software. We know how important software is. To us, this is very, very clear. So it is to the software heritage people. Um, software drives our lives these days, but software is fragile. Storage fails, archives disappear, sometimes you uploaded something in your own lab where you did graduate work or something. So we need to preserve this, and software is really key to how we do science and research now. And, and Software Heritage stepped forward to preserve um, free source code, um, software source code that is accessible to, to present and future generations and creates a massively large um, data set and archive that I'll talk about a little. So that's, that's a little before, below the rotating banner, which I just basically sequenced into four slides with shots. They collect, preserve, and share. So it's basically an in, in large indexing job. And um, it might also be useful at this point to just stop and briefly thank our core and CRAN for what they do, because software heritage basically index and archives, and the work that's been done in our community because of the standards and infrastructure set by our core and particularly CRAN is really easy to index because all the metadata is there. So sort of a quick really sort of thumbs up and thank you to CRAN for what they do. We wouldn't be here without them and this, this wouldn't be happening. So, you know, who is Software Heritage really briefly? I know the fellow at the, on the bottom not the one at the top. The two of them work together. They're both profs at Paris Diderot and currently on leave at INRIA. INRIA is a large French research organization that also some of the organizers of the conference are affiliated with. So uh, Roberto Di Cosmo is the founder and CEO who runs it. Stefano Zaccheroli uh, is the CTO, uh, technical architect. Um, and they, not unlike Bioconductor, have 
funding and staff. All the software that they do is, of course, open source and out there. They happen to do most of their stuff in Python. Um, the website is really slick, the main website. And under, I think it's support, is a large page with testimonies. They have massive support from funders and other organizations, um, including UNESCO, which is, of course, also French-based with the headquarters in Paris, but also others. And because I knew my co-author for this presentation and follow him on Twitter, I saw that I think they had a reception at the Elysee and you know, UNESCO. It's, 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 a really, uh, it's a really decent and well-recognized undertaking because of what they do. Um, they're also computer scientists, so there's a lot of really slick technology behind it that they document. And because I only have 10 minutes, and I forgot to put my timer on, uh, I have absolutely no chance of going through this, but this is sort of a brief overview about how it flows. There's the sources on the left, and they, they've wrote what they call listers, basically things that go to the meta indices, download, look at the files, and then get in there, and you recognize the logos of all those things, so a lot of it is code repositories, because they're there to be read. Obviously, there was GitHub and Bitbucket and you know, others. Um, they have injected, they took all of Debian and Ubuntu in, uh, Fedora, but also some language-specific ones, um, including Python and, uh, and NPM, JavaScript, uh, Perl, and then sort of these, these and, and also they can access you know, SVN and others, and how about all the rest of it, so that's the thing in the middle. And then a lot of stuff happens that's loading and deduplication. And basically, the main data structure behind it is a Merkle tree, a massive DAG, directed acyclic graph, and a lot of it happened with the, um, with the SHA sums. But in the, the theory behind this was already developed, and they just basically set on that for, um, um, for using it. So there's a bit more detail again on that. So it's Merkle trees, which is a well understood CS data structure. It's also inside Git and blockchains and, and other things, and it already gives them deduplication, which of course, as you can imagine, matters because there's a bit of redundancy with several software archives because the same source may appear several times, so certain header files are in different sources and, and so on. So um, uh, here I took something from the coverage page. The most impressive stuff is the numbers at the bottom, and they sort of change daily. They tweeted maybe four weeks ago that they surpassed six billion source files, which is really staggering. Uh, corresponding to you know, 500 change billion directories, the other most sort of tangible ones, almost 25 million authors and almost 90 million projects. This is, this is really big. And I found the graphic in the middle also kind of nice and motivating because there is very clearly one logo missing. And that's what this talk is about, that we're sort of trying to stick Cran in, and because they already have all this infrastructure, there wasn't that much to do. Um, oh, sort of still, yeah, size and other things. So here's something sort of what they have, and they just updated um, this because they often give talks too. So this is just static graphs that I got from their slides repository, um, how it grew to 6 billion files, commits, projects. Um, so the raw data is about 200 TB. There's a 6 TB database in there with sort of 10 billion nodes and 100 billion edges. So it's the richest public source Coke R5, and it's, it's growing daily. Now, you know, we are, we're data people. We're, we're, we're empiricists. We measure. So I could foresee a lot of empirical software engineering folks or others, empirical sociologists looking at the code networks, I mean, digging through this. It's out there and in the, in the open. And they're also just fun guys, because they obviously it's all Debian tech with, 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 with Stefano leading this. Um, his tweets are sometimes funny because then they have these processing jobs and there he was just, you know, going on using GNU sort and proper shell mode from the bottom tweet to uh, go through seven terabytes of data um, and just, you know, looking at HTOP as we all do. I guess his jobs are a little bigger than mine. And yeah, so what's happening with R? Uh, because Git's in there, a few things are in there, so I use the search facility to find something. Um, uh, I would have loved to show you uh, sort of the initial Ross and Robert commit, we don't quite have that, but here's an example of a Brian Ripley content, so now my life's complete, because I can say I gave a talk to a lot of people where I take credit for Brian Ripley's work. I'm not, it's just, I'm showing just the sequence, it's just, it took a, a package where I could easily show a sequence over several years, sort of all the releases are already 
already in there. So what's happening this summer is that they do also participate in Google Summer of Code, and one student had as one of his tasks to write what they call a lister uh, for CRAN, and when you know CRAN and some of the tunnels, it's, it's pretty straightforward. You just get the RDS metadata and then know where to get the tables from, and this is sort of the, the regularly scheduled updating CRAN should be happening anytime soon. So if, if in a month or so or in some weeks we go back to the Software Architect um, website, we should see some CRAN content. And uh, again, I said the website is great. There's lots of good um, content. The main stuff is at softwareheritage.org. The archive can be searched at those two links. Uh, these are actual links in my PDF slides, so if you don't want to copy them, you can just click on them. There is also a REST API, so I'm sure someone will be writing a CRAN package accessing the REST API. If you want to look into how they do things, it's all out in the open. Uh, they use an, uh, uh, one of these forges, the same software tree that, that, that our forge um, uh, lives on, um, and uh, it has the code, and uh, there's some development information there. And with that, again, sort of Thanks very much to the organizers to sneak us in on short notice because all of this only came together a couple of weeks, months ago. Big thanks to everybody writing and releasing and maintaining software worth archiving because, you know, the opening slide said sort of software is key and that's really sort of all of you. So that's, that's good. And to everybody hosting, GitHub, CRAN, and whoever it is. And that's all I have. And I think I managed my time window. Thank you. So we'll switch to the flash pasta presentation. So it should be warm. My oh my. Okay.